with, uh, I think I'm on, right? Not on yet? I am on. Yes, yes here we go. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, welcome, like I said. Normally we'd be together at Community uh, Good Friday service. Uh, last year we weren't together at all. And uh, this year we're not quite ready to get all our churches back together. So we're here. And I was determined that we were not going to go another year without getting together. And so glad you could be with us tonight. Just a, a couple of announcements for you. Uh, this is Friday, but Sundays are coming. And we have our 8 o'clock service. Um, Pastor Shelley was scheduled to preach. She's not feeling well, so I've got double duty on Sunday. Um, but 8 o'clock service and followed by breakfast at around 9 o'clock or so, Sunday school, and then the regular 11 o'clock service. Uh, all of, both of those services will, will be online as well. Remind, I remind you last Sunday, and I remind you now that uh, traditionally we have our Easter offering on uh, Easter Sunday. So if you have a chance to pray about that and what you'd like to help keep uh, missionaries, we just, as the Church of Nazarene, just officially entered our 164th nation, the, the nation of Luxembourg, uh, that they're now registered as a Church of the Nazarene. So that keeps our missionaries where they are, helps to build uh, uh, the kingdom uh, throughout uh, the world. So if you'd like to give toward that, just any you know, offering, just market missions, it goes directly for that support. And though we normally would have a Sunday evening service on Easter Sunday with a Borba uh, afterglow and communion, we are serving communion on Sunday morning this year. Um, both, both the morning service, their sunrise service as well as during the choir presentation as well. So we will not be having a Sunday evening service on Easter this year. So this is where we are. Got all down in your mental notebook. You're so scattered. I wish I could just move. I won't move you, but I just wish you could come up close and, and uh, be a part tonight. It's going to be an interesting evening together. So let's pray. We thank you, Father. We uh, remind it again and again and again, year after year, about the cross. And that, so it seems to be such a terrible Friday. It turned out to be such a great Friday because through the death of our Lord and the eventual resurrection three days later, we have a whole new way of living, a whole new life ahead eternally with Jesus. So thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together in freedom and worship tonight. May you bless those that uh, are with us and those at home listening to us, watching us. Be with Pastor Shelley, especially tonight, and her family, that uh, you might touch her body physically to get over the, uh, the bug that's bugging her. And we just pray, Father, for uh, the community as some churches are having special services tonight as well as ours. And may you bless and meet with us, Lord. We come together as your disciples who so long ago didn't understand what was going on, but we can rejoice. Thank you, Lord, for dying for us and rising again. We'll give you praise, Lord. Be with us tonight as we walk through this service. In Jesus' name, amen. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross.
titled, In the Footsteps of Jesus, One Man's Journey. It's written by a man named Bruce Marciano, who was the actor chosen to play Jesus in the film entitled Matthew, Jesus Christ according to the Gospel of Matthew. I want to share with you some of his thoughts tonight. Think about it. Jesus is the son of the living God. He performed countless miracles, displaying power beyond anyone's comprehension. All the power of heaven and earth combined and beyond, in fact. Surely as he stood before Pilate that day, he had that same power waiting at his fingertips. If he wanted, he could have done some equally amazing thing in front of everyone that day. He could have snapped his divine fingers and turned the whole bunch of them into a pack of baboons, if he had wanted. At the very least, he could have spoken up for himself. But as Matthew records, with all those options available, Jesus stood silent that day, doing and saying nothing. That is, with one exception. When Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus responded saying, yes, it is as you say. Or in other words, yes, I am the Messiah. Other than that, nothing. Now I had to sit back in my chair and take a hard look at that. Why? He could have done anything that day. So why that one particular thing? After all, and this is the big key, if anyone had a choice, it's the son of the living God. He chose to say only one thing, the very one thing that would get him killed. Why should he love me so? I am unworthy of all his kindness and faithfulness, but you have shown your servant mercy. Why should he love me? Why should he love? 
Jesus alone. Most everyone he knew and trusted, gone. The whole world staring at his nakedness, spit and pain, insults and lies, mockery and laughter, his only companions. And in that moment, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthian, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, as alone as any of us have ever been, none of us have ever been that alone. Abandoned by the Father. It's utterly inconceivable. He was so completely alone that day. Jesus. I remember during the scene, they found a little wooden chair for me to rest on between setups. It was placed away from the action, and I would sit there by myself as breaks permitted. While sitting there at one point, I felt something on my left hand, craning my head around to see out of my one good eye. I saw the little 12-year-old Moroccan girl who had played Jairus' daughter. She was standing next to me, silently holding my hand in hers. She never said a word, just stood there holding my hand for a good 30 minutes, tears tumbling down her cheeks. She was reaching out to me, caring for me in the only way she knew how, until finally they called me to go back on the cross and I had to leave. I can't tell you what that little girl and her simply holding my hand meant in that half hour. To have someone care in the middle of such incredible aloneness. That silent, brave little girl was reaching out with such breathtaking innocence. She'll never know all that she meant to me that day. Now I'll never know all that she meant to me that day. At the cross, there is room for us all, young and old, wise and foolish. We have a place because there is still room.
Suddenly, that image of a poor, helpless Jesus, a victim of those cruel, jealous men, disappeared in a heartbeat. Suddenly, I saw a Jesus who was not a victim at all, but who was actually controlling the situation every step of the way. A Jesus who was intentionally pushing the specific buttons that would drive them to execute him. He knew the fulfillment of his mission and he knew that he had to do what he had to do to get there. So there he is acting helpless and defeated but actually pulling the strings on the entire event playing everyone like puppets straight into his plan for salvation. Yes, Jesus was in the one in charge that day. Not Pilate, not the Pharisees, not anyone else for that matter. It was Jesus. Those guys thought they had him, but he had them. Reacting frame for frame, just as he wanted, so he'd be sure to end up exactly where he needed to be, on the cross. It's so vital a thing for us all to grasp. Jesus wasn't forced to the cross. He chose the cross. And on that day, that most awful of days, he wasn't dragged to the cross. He was crawling to the cross. His battered body was giving out on him. He had little life remaining in him. Yet he had to make it to the cross fighting against the pain, struggling, clawing, groping, clawing with everything he had. One more step, one more step, almost there, one more, made it. And the hammer drops. On the cross of Calvary, bearing the shame and agony, he paid for us. He endured the cross, scorning its shame. thought he was the one. We all thought he was the one. Everyone did. 
There was a party, and we were all, we were all there, and, and some woman comes in, and she has a bottle of perfume, a, expensive perfume, and she just pours it all over him. She did that because she thought he was the one. What a waste. We could have sold that perfume and used the money for a greater purpose. I tried to tell him as much. But he came back at me insinuating that he was the purpose. Even so, I believed he was the one. I believed that he was gonna turn everything upside down. I, 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 just, I just knew it. I mean, people would have followed him anywhere. All he had to do was just say the word, but he wouldn't say the word. Instead, he, my time has not yet come. That's what he would say over and over to me, my time has not yet come. Are you kidding me? He was raising people from the dead for crying out loud. He was healing the blind, producing food out of thin air. My time has not yet come. So I forced his hand. I made his time come. Things needed to push, and I was the only one that had the courage to do it. We were all up there eating. We were all up there. He looks across the table to me, and he says, get on with it. How, how did he know what I was going to do? It wasn't about the money. It was not about the money. It's just when you have that kind of power that he has, why wouldn't you leverage it to forward, to forward the agenda? People listen to him. You know the sound a wave makes after it hits the shore? and how quiet it gets after a few seconds when it stops. That was Jesus. When he spoke, it was like a, a rolling wave. And the crowds listening They were the hush at the end of the wave. Because when he spoke and you were there in his presence, there was no doubt in anyone's mind he was the one. The Jewish day begins at sunset and goes through the evening, the morning, and on to the next sunset. So the Jewish Friday <clears throat> actually began on Thursday evening with the Passover supper that Jesus was sitting there with his disciples. Continued on. It ends with uh, his death and, and burial. The next day, <clears throat> before sundown, and the beginning of the Jewish Sabbath. The path Jesus chose to take that day led him from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane to these arrests and trial before the Sanhedrin, to the scourging and crucifixion by order of Pilate, 
than his burial in a borrowed tomb by Joseph and Nicodemus. However, Judas Iscariot chose a different path that day. Path of betrayal, then remorse, finally suicide by hanging. We know the story of Jesus very well. How many Good Friday services have you heard preached over the years? <clears throat> but let's look at the path that Judas chose. Who was Judas Iscariot? <clears throat> Where was he from? One view is that Iscariot refers to the city of Kirioth, a region or a town in Judea, south of Jerusalem. Possibly, <clears throat> Judas Iscariot was the only Judean in the band of disciples, of the apostles. Another idea is that Kirioth refers to the Sciati, Sicari, I'm sorry, the Sicari. <clears throat> they were a cadre of assassins among the Jewish rebels. They desired to kill all the Romans they could. A possible association with the Sicari allows for interesting speculation about Judas' motives for his betrayal. Whatever or whichever is the fact regarding Judas. The fact is <clears throat> that that day he would make a conscious choice to betray Jesus. But still, <clears throat> Jesus chose Judas Iscariot as one of his 12 apostles. He followed Jesus for three years, <clears throat> was given power along with the other apostles to drive out demons, cure diseases in Jesus' name. And he did. We don't know who was his associate. Jesus sent them out two by two. <clears throat> Would you like to go out with Judas Iscariot as your partner in healing and driving out demons? How could someone not understand? How could someone who was not a true believer do such things in Jesus' name? Jesus knew from the very beginning what Jesus Iscariot would do. In our video, I said, you know, Judas, how did he know what he was going to do? Jesus knew. He told his disciples in John chapter 6, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. At the Last Supper, Jesus predicted a betrayal, identified the betrayer. Jesus answered, Is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish? Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. Yet no one suspected Judas. He was a trusted member of the Twelve. And even when Jesus told Judas, what you're about to do, do quickly. And Judas left the Last Supper. The others at the table simply thought Judas had been sent to buy more food or to give something to charity, give to the poor. No one had any idea that Judas was betraying Jesus. So we asked the question, <clears throat> what caused the hardening of Judas Iscariot's heart toward Jesus? Was it because of a false understanding of who Jesus was, why he came? Was it wanting to force Jesus' hand to assume the throne of David, to drive out the Romans, to put himself as a secretary of the treasure for the nation under Jesus as king? get a lot of money that way if you're the Secretary of the Treasury. John writes in his gospel, <clears throat> the only explanation that he could see was demonic. As soon as Jesus took the bread, Satan entered into him, John records. During this scene in John chapter 13, it appears the devil has already prompted Judas to betray Jesus. The Bible does not say why Jesus did it, why Judas did it. His habits with the money bag might suggest greediness. It's also quite possible he was troubled by Jesus' insistence that he would die. 
Many were looking for that powerful, strong political leader, a Messiah. And yet Jesus was not what they expected. So when the Bible talks about Satan was involved in Jesus' action, we're not quite sure to what extent. For I believe that Judas was fully responsible for his actions. He chose. So let's pick up the story of Matthew chapter 26. <clears throat> Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane with the other apostles. And you can remain seated today as we read from Matthew 26, beginning with verse 47. While he was still speaking, <clears throat> Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. <clears throat> then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into this place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled? that it must be so. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, <clears throat> have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place and the scripture of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Then when Jesus, Judas, the betrayer, <clears throat> saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See it, see to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, <clears throat> he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest taking the pieces of silver said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. So they took counsel and brought with them, bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore the field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, <clears throat> And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price has been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them to the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Judas Iscariot betrayed the Lord with a kiss. Some would say perfectly in keeping with the brazen duplicity of his life. After committing this atrocious act, Judas was seized with remorse, returned the 30 piece silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. But we learned that remorse does not equal repentance. Rather than make amends or seek forgiveness, he went away and hanged himself. So I've also asked the question, <clears throat> could Judas Iscariot have been forgiven like Peter was after Peter's denial of Jesus three times that day? Which was the greater? Betraying Jesus at night or betraying Jesus three times at night? I believe that Judas Iscariot could have been forgiven. Yet he chose not to wait <clears throat> because he thought that there was no hope for him and no hope for Jesus. I would say to us tonight that no matter what we have done, there is always hope of forgiveness if we truly repent. Judas fulfilled multiple prophecies <clears throat> hundreds of years before Judas 
birth was uh, predicted by his betrayal. Zechariah predicted Jesus would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And Psalm 41 predicted that Jesus' betrayer would share his bread, which Jesus directly referenced in John 13. Thus God knew this disastrous turn of events long before it ever occurred. You see, God was not blindsided by the betrayal. In fact, it was part of his plan. In order to save the world from sin, the Bible claims Jesus had to die. God therefore used Judas' betrayal to help bring about the salvation of his people in that day and in this day. Someone has written, <clears throat> Satan may have thought he was thwarting God's plan through Judas, but the results show just how impossible that is. Judas reminds us that God is always in control. Judas' name itself simply means let God be praised and is a reminder that even in the worst of situations, be used by God in powerful ways. Now, by contrast, Jesus chose the path to the cross to do his Father's will and provide a path for our salvation. And we pick up the story again in Matthew 27, verse 45, with these words. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, basically noon to three in the afternoon. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. One of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. In Matthew's Gospel records, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs were also open. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his res this resurrection, they went into this holy city and appeared to many. Now that would get you in tension on Easter Sunday, wouldn't it? When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph. That would be the Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. We look at the cross today through the lens of an empty tomb and Jesus' resurrection on the third day. Disciples didn't have that luxury of hindsight. Their world had caved in. Their hope was gone. They were either crying or fearful for their life that they would be next. To them, their Messiah was dead and all hope was gone. What would you have thought if that was you back then? How would you have felt going through the events of that Friday? Running away in the Garden of Gethsemane for fear you'd be captured. Denying Jesus as Peter did in the courtyard of the high priest. Watching either up close as John was or from a distance, Jesus on the cross crying out his last breath and dying. Maybe watching as Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took him down and took him to the tomb. Maybe they were so hurt, so afraid, they'd already left the cross. They didn't know where to put him. They didn't know what to do. 
So what should occupy our thoughts as we meditate on the death of Jesus this evening? What should occupy our thoughts as we think about the death of Jesus dying on that cross for our sins on that rugged cross? Is it just another day in the church calendar? Something we do before Easter? It's Friday, yes, Sundays are coming. Yes, we know that. It's sort of, Friday's not important because resurrection. Yes, if it hadn't been for the resurrection, Friday would just be another criminal dying on a cross. But if it hadn't been for the cross, resurrection would have no meaning. There would have been no resurrection. I want you to pause in your own spirits, in your own thinking, and try to imagine what the disciples might have been going through as we listen to the sounds of the cross. through this weekend, reflect again on what Jesus' death meant for you, for all the pain, all the judgment of sin placed upon him. It's what enabled us to be forgiven and be freed from that. We have been set free. The whole world has been forgiven though many would not choose to accept that forgiveness because they refuse to repent. But you have come here tonight to remember once again, he died for you, he died for me, and we have received that forgiveness and that grace of reconciliation with God because of the cross. So tonight as we go home, Tomorrow, which we normally think of as the quiet day. Saturday was the day when it was the Sabbath. You're not supposed to, in Jewish times, to even walk very far on the Sabbath. They were in despair and discouragement and fear of death themselves, gathered together. And then Sunday came, and everything changed. We'll be celebrating that on Sunday. But until then... Spend some time with the Lord. Allow him to remind you again what cost he paid that you and I could be free. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. As we walk briefly through the events of that last day, Jesus' life on earth, before the tomb. We're reminded again that Jesus was in control. He was to fulfill prophecy. He could have snapped his fingers and legions of angels could have come and freed him. But he chose not to. He chose to go through it all Endure the suffering, endure the pain, endure those nails, endure that spear in his side, endure the humiliation, endure death for us. 
the only way. Without the blood being shed, there's no forgiveness of sins. And the greatest sacrifice of all, the Lamb of God gave himself that day for us. Help us, Lord, not to think glibly or lightly of what actually took place then. We would have been scared. We would have been running for our lives. We would have been hiding. We would have been in pain, knowing that our whole world had collapsed if we had been disciples back in that day. But Jesus knew that resurrection was coming. And he was willing to commit himself into the hands of the Father, knowing that the price had been paid and eternal life had been secured for us. So Lord, go with us tonight as we go home. Bless these dear folk that have come out here to remember once again the cross of Jesus. Give us, Lord, a good weekend, a good time on Sunday to rejoice and celebrate. Jesus is alive. We'll give you praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.